thanks a lot for the invitation and being selected as a part of this awesome group of 12 people. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the research that we do, but I promise that I don't have any data whatsoever. Not because I'm the last one talking, but because my, my son, my nine-month-old, decided to uh, wake up at three in the morning and start playing around with me. So I, I'm on very little sleep and a ton of caffeine. So if I start shaking, you know exactly what's going on. Don't call, don't call 911. So to give you a little bit of an idea of the kind of research that we do, um, we like to have fun in the lab. So when we were asked to come up with a title for this um, and an abstract, I decided to make it both uh, the title and the abstract a haiku. So that's how, we, that's how we came up with both of this, ti this, this title and probably the shortest abstract that I've written in my life. <laughs> and the other part that I want you to point out is that we have a Twitter handle, so if you're interested in that, you know, more than welcome to look it up. My group also has a Twitter handle. They're completely responsible for whatever is posted on that site. I just have to warn you ahead of time. And we also have a, a group logo. This was much to uh, my group's resistance of having a group logo. I decided to go for it. And the group logo actually reflects the way that we think about research. So the group logo is, is, the, is founded on, on the Aztec symbol for movement, for change. So I'm Mexican, and I wanted to reflect that in, in the group logo. So you can look it up. It's Ojin, and you can, and you can see that it actually means this, this type of change. Now, so in my group, uh, we focus a lot on change and diversity. So I'm showing you here a picture of the changes that have gone in the places that I call home. Ever since I was born in Guadalajara, uh, this is in Mexico, it's the second biggest city in Mexico. And I lived there for until I was uh, 11 years, then I moved to Los Angeles, um, where I basically stayed my entire life up until five years ago when I moved to New York. And I can really say that this sort of being exposed to diverse cities all around, very large uh, metropolitan areas, have really motivated how we sort of structure the way that we do science in the group. And I can easily say now that I love my job just like this fat kick loves cake, right? <laughs> so in terms of the research, uh, there doesn't seem to reflect that there was a lot of change. So I started in a small college, uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills. It's in Carson, California. And it actually, the, the college is called Dominguez Hills because it's actually found in Rancho Dominguez, but Rancho Dominguez is actually Compton. And just for political purposes, people decided to call it Dominguez Hills so that you can actually attract uh, scientists to come and, or people in general to come to this, to, to this school. So after going to Cal State Compton, I moved slightly up north to uh, UCLA, about a 45-minute drive. And there I did my PhD with uh, Miguel Garcia Garibay and also joined with Ken Houck. So it was more now in the hardcore physical organic chemistry. So as an undergrad, I did more computational chemistry. So there was a little bit of a transition of going into the lab and now exploring how reactions happen in organic crystals. And being the, you know, the uh, extravagant person that I am, I decided to drive an hour north to Santa Barbara <laughs> Uh, still staying in the coast where it's nice and warm, close to the beach, even closer to the beach this time, where I joined the lab of Professor Craig Hawker at UC Santa Barbara in, in the materials research lab. And again, the diversity here came from me being in Santa Barbara. Uh, it's, a very, it's not a very diverse city, <laughs> but, but the, the lab was extremely diverse and the nature of the projects that we were exposed were amazing. So I went from physical organic chemistry to materials chemistry, focusing in exploring thiolene click chemistry for the development of soft lithographic techniques. And after Santa Barbara, taking everything that I've learned from computational chemistry to physical organic chemistry to polymer science and engineering, I run another very fun group, and this is a picture of a pop crawl that we did, all dressed as Santa Claus, just a couple of years ago. And that gives you the nature of, of the flavor of the types of activities that are going on in the lab. Now, I should mention that this was an all-day pub crawl, and they actually organized a pre-gaming session before we went out on an all-day drinking streak. But anyway, so that's, that's how the group operates. Um, so the change here has been, and the movement here has been basically focusing on bringing in fundamental chemistry to advance materials properties. And that's the general theme of what we do. And a lot of this type of motivation comes from the way nature creates advanced materials. I'm showing you two examples that we don't study at all, but have very interesting properties. I'm showing you the lotus leaf and the feet of gecko. 
These exhibit extraordinary properties that are founded on the fact that you have a hierarchical structure from the molecular level. So being able to control the chemistry of the molecular building blocks and being able to understand what happens in the mesoscale all the way up to their function is something that we really take to heart. How can you get very complex properties from very simple building blocks? That's sort of the key question that we, that we try to address in my group. And the way that we break it down, we focus a lot in the molecular level engineering of the macromolecules that we study. And one approach that we take is by studying the relationship between the building blocks, their macromolecules, and their function. So I'm showing you a, a very generic representation of a block of polymer. And in this block of polymer, the way that we try to study the properties is by looking at the monomers that go into making the systems. Once we study the properties of the macromolecular materials, we can then re-engineer by deconstructing what we've understand from these macromolecules. So by simply changing either the type of monomers that we use, we can engineer different molecular building blocks and be able to create another life cycle for the materials optimization process. And by focusing on the fundamental chemistry, this gives us a divergent approach to access many types of applications. So my group is not interested in making the best gene delivery vector. We're not making, in making the best solar cell. We're really interested in understanding how the macromolecular architecture influences these types of applications. Okay, so today what I want to show you is that in my group, with just three types of building blocks, we can focus on biomaterials, block of polymers and processing, electronic structure and their properties, and so in even going into fuel cells and energy storage. And this is based on simple three building blocks in, in my group. And if you want to learn about these building blocks, all of my students are here at this meeting, and they're going to be speaking about all of the projects that are going on. So just to give you a little bit of the flavor of the type of chemistry that we do, I'm going to focus on the research that we're doing on solar cells. So in solar cells, so far what we've known is that they've been categorized in three different classes. The first class is what we've already come to see and love all in, in, in everyday life. These are the polycrystalline silicon solar cells. These are commercially available. These are what I call aesthetically challenged. They're ugly things, right? These are these big blocks that people put up on their houses, and it really changes the overall feel about the house, right? I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> And the second generation is anything that could be made into a thin film, whether it be inorganic, organic, whatever, you name it. Okay, if it's a thin film, it's a second generation photovoltaic. So that takes us to the third generation of solar cells. And the difference here is that both the first and second generation operate by conventional mechanisms. That means one photon gives you two, uh, one electron uh, charge pair. But once we get into the third generation, we're now starting to think about non-conventional mechanisms to generate photocurrent. And my group focuses on multi-exciton generation. Multi-exciton generation is what I call a, a solar cell on steroids. I mean, you put in one photon and you get two excitons in your active material. So just to give you again a little bit of a comparison between the first, second, and the third generation photovoltaics. If you look at a single junction solar cell, you can calculate the maximal theoretical li uh, limit of operation could be 33%. That's because if you excite your active layer with excess energy, you lose that energy to thermal fluctuations to create a cool exciton. But if you can harness this excess energy with an active material for third generation photovoltaics, you can overcome the shockley quizer limit to about 44%, where now one photon harnesses the excess energy to create two excitons. So one photon, two excitons in your active layer. You can potentially generate more charge carriers in your active layer, thereby improving the overall photovoltaic efficiency of your device. So without getting into ma major details about what we've done in my group, we're starting to look at structure property relationships of how to design materials that can give you multiple excitons so that you can then exploit them in photovoltaic devices. And I'm showing you here four examples of molecules that have come up from our group. 
we started looking at this class of polymeric systems where we started to understand that the charge transfer state in the photoexcited state is very important to create multiple excitons. But later on, we've come to understand oligoacins as coupled dimers from a lot of work that many people have pioneered. That this, these dimers alone can give you highly efficient multi-exciton generation. And out of this, we've, we've started to look at the new different classes of materials and really understanding what happens once you generate two excitons per molecule. And very recently, we finally came to understand the photophysics of polypentacene, which should be coming up in the general chemistry in the next issue. Now, I've talked a lot about diversity, and this is the picture of my group. It's 10 students right now, two postdocs and eight graduate students. They're an exciting bunch, to be honest. They're probably like, once the things that come up from the group come up, it's because of the interactions that we have in the lab. They're an amazing bunch to work with. They make my job so much better to show up to work when I show up to work. <laughs> and at the same time, none of our projects are driven by one person. They're all collaborative. Notice my list of collaborators. It's way more collaborators than I have graduate students. So each graduate student gets, and postdoc, gets to interact with multiple people in this list at once. So this is the fun part, and this is what I, I really strive to do, is really change the way that uh, my group operates in, in simply looking at multiple exposures, looking at a lot of interdisciplinary research, and that's what makes it a lot of fun for us. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>